Uh, I'm Maria Nodoff of the Orange Ale History Project. Today is May 30th, 2022, and I'm here with Ken Benedict, our videographer, and we're here to interview the Culbertson brothers. We have Jim and Jerry Culbertson. So, first of all, uh, guys, tell me, um, you, you said your parents built these, these, your house and, and this house. No, not this one. Oh, okay. We moved into this house when we came. And but your parents had built it. No. Oh, okay. No, we. It was a tiny little house when we first got here. I don't know what it was, eight hundred square feet or something. So did so you arrived with your parents? March the fifteenth, nineteen fifty-two. Early afternoon. Okay, and you were because uh, it was my birthday. Oh. oh, and I got I got my birthday cake, which was a Hostess cupcake, but I only got half of it because Jerry got the other one, but mine had a candle in it. <laughs> Your half? <laughs> wow. <laughs> my half. Dad goes, we're too busy. Oh. He goes, get out of the car and unload all the stuff. And where were you coming from? Nebraska. Nebraska. And uh, so why did you move here? Couldn't make it farming. It didn't make any money. In fact, when we repoed the farm, what year did I go back and repo the farm? Well, I was still working for the crane company. I don't I'm guessing remember. 80s or 90s. Corn uh -huh. was only selling for 10 cents a bushel more than it was when we moved out here. Oh. Couldn't make the payment. Yeah. You know, I used to borrow the money from the local bank and they would su supply all the merchants there and just there was no profits you bet on the crop hole. if the hail came through or tornado no crops so your parents were farmers and when they came to orangevale what did they do uh, dad got a job working for uh, smith art waddy smith art and uh, what's your dad's name? It was Ray. It was actually Raymond, but Ray is like mine's James. Okay, and uh, so he worked for the for uh, Mr. Smithart uh, for how long? I don't remember. I don't think it was. It wasn't very long. I don't know. Maybe, maybe a year, and then he went to work for a guy named Frank Galley in Roseville, who had the seventy-six distributorship distributorship for all the stove oil and stuff. And Dad delivered stove oil to all the farmers and ranchers out before the lake was there. Everywhere up to here, Placer. Yeah, he went out to Slough House. Yeah, all over. Okay, and uh, did he do that for a long time? Yeah, I think. I don't know. No, and I lied to you. Before that, he went to work at McClellan. Uh, he built a crates of some built time. crates for belly tankers, and it drove him crazy. And he quit working for them, and then went to work for Frank Kelly. So you came. You were, uh, I guess, you started kindergarten that fall, or that, or right away. I think it was right away. That's why they moved me around so much. And what school? What what was the school you started? The little red one there on the corner of. It was. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if there was even a name on it. You had to climb up the side of the mountain to get to it. I always thought it was Orangeville, but it's not Orangeville because Orangeville was down here and it started. No, that's right on the border. And what what street yeah. corner was this? Jesus. But Orangeville School? No, the, no, the no. little red one. That was on the corner of Greenback Lane and uh, Kenneth. Okay. It's right on the border of Orangeville and Fair It's Oaks. on the northeast corner, or it was. Yeah. Okay. And you went there for one day? One day. Old schoolhouse, you couldn't see, no light. And then I went to Roberts. And I don't know, two or three days there. And then that was what a happened? new school. Then I went back to Orangeville School down here. All right, and that was uh, where it is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Central and and uh, and Philbert. 
Yeah, I've only lived here all my life, and I don't know the name of the streets past Walnut and, and May. Now, what about you, Jerry? What about me? Um, how old were you when you arrived in, in Orangeville? I was probably, he says three or four, but I don't... No, you were three, because I, I was five. He has a much better bet memory than I do. But, uh, He's two years behind me. I was born in 49, so you can figure that out. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I didn't go to school until Orangeville school, and I went through there till uh, uh, seventh grade, and then they decided they were going to have junior high schools, except there was no junior highs. Uh, what was it, Pershing School? Don't ask me. The time you made it to Pershing there, it wasn't school, in the Army? I, it was, you know... I don't the that. first I went there for eighth grade, then from there I went to Bella Vista. Mm -hmm. And your high school, Bella Vista, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I was a second four-year class. Okay. All right, second class. Sixty-four. I'm graduating in sixty-five. The sixty-four was the first one. In fact, I was going to have the Sheree, the girl that I run with, come down, but. It's something happened. She lived over on the bluff, so she has got recollections that are completely different than ours. And then she moved back over here, and I'll give you her phone number if you wish. Yes. She can tell you the story of George McGrath, who lived one house up from where she lives now. Yeah. And they came down here in a covered wagon from Truckee. All right. And her name is? Cherie, E-R-I-E. Cook. With an E or no E? No E. Okay, I'll get I'll get her number later. Um, so, uh, so you you went through the grades. What was your childhood like? Uh, eat breakfast and get out of the house. And Our mother to, didn't believe. No, no, no. You didn't stay in the house. She went outside. No. You went out to play. As soon and as you got done eating breakfast, it was the door swung one way. Yeah, you went outside. And you went outside. She goes, you don't, you don't stay inside. And we played with the Bacon Boys. Yeah. And There's a couple other kids in the neighborhood. Well, there. the Van Horns. Van Horns. That live in a little back house down there. They're the ones that had the first the Van Horn market there on Greenback. And the building that they just tore down to make the gas station. It used to be Vans. That was also built by them. Mm -hmm. And then they moved someplace up towards Lincoln or something and started over. Is that where the name Van came from? Yep, Van Horns. Yeah, yeah pretty simple, huh? <laughs> yes, I guess so. Oh, and Orangeville Glass started underneath that store. Oh. Yeah. So. Which is now the auto parts store. Yeah. So. Um, you played outside. Did you, were you let in for lunch? Yep. When she yeah. came out and yelled, you came home and ate. Yeah, if you didn't make it at noontime? Too bad. There were rules. Don't come home. No coddling here. Dinner was at five. Yep. Well, we and didn't you have could to stay in. The, I think you could stay in the house after five. Yeah, after five. Yeah, then we couldn't go back outside. Side, yeah. But we that was easy because Betty Bacon, she could whistle. And you could hear it, and when Echo. she whistled, that was, you know, everybody scattered and we went home because it was, you know, somewhere around five. And she just passed away Gosh, a couple months ago. Yeah, she was 100, 100 years old and 10 months. Oh. Too bad you didn't get to talk to her because she never skipped a beat with her. Oh, no, she had a with her very mind. sharp she mind. Was, we used to take her to lunch, and she'd remember back a thousand years and go, now, was it Gary or you that set the field on fire? Which field? Back here? I go, it was that Gary. That was Gary. That was her son. Uh, so who said, was it really? Gary. Oh, okay. Well, I think he said it once and I said it once. We were just putting it out to see if we could do it. Well, yeah, we lighted the stomp on it. You know, but the just, third time we waited too long. Yeah. And then what happened? Fire department came and we got scolded. I bet. A lot. I bet. <laughs> we got whooped. What was your mother's name? Lois. 
So uh, this obviously is in the summertime and on weekends. Uh, during the school year, uh, I guess you walked to school. Oh no, we rode our bikes. Rode our bikes, okay. I walked and I rode it. Well, junior high, I rode my bike mm -hmm. over there. Well, high was, school, we was able to ride the bus. Yeah, you know, catch the bus up at the corner on Main. Yeah, but I think we only rode it. I only rode it for two years. Not me. That's a long walk from Bella Vista. Yeah. I, well, I didn't walk it. I just I always found well, friends that could drive. I was in the army, so I didn't get any of those luxuries. So it, you're you're the only two siblings. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so uh, what about school days? Who were your favorite teachers? Did you have any? And, and well, I remember there was one, Mr. Welch, and I, what grade was he, sixth? Could have been, sixth or because seven. Because he was, I remember him. whatever you call a coin collector. And one day he brought the whole class in, the little blue fold-out folders for pennies, and he brought in Gosh, I don't know. He must have brought in 30 rolls of pennies that had a different date. And he gave everybody in his class one so they could fill their book up to get them interested in coins. And, and, it, and so. before that, when we were, I don't know, second grade or first grade, the teachers all gathered us up with our parents and took us down to Bank of America and opened up a savings account. That's yeah. nice. I do remember that. That was the I, was the kindergarten teacher. I don't remember. I just remember going down there with mom, going, "Why? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're going to learn to save money." But Mr. Welch was an eighth grade teacher. He was our coach, our basketball coach, and he was like one of the guys because we had a basketball game over at is it Twin Lakes. The high school, the grade school over there, and he had a big old station wagon, and he piled the whole team and all the cheerleaders in it. And we went over and lost, of course, but on the way home, the girls were sitting on top of the car. <laughs> he got in trouble. We all got in trouble, but I mean, he was a great teacher. And Mr. Lynn was the principal, and he played in a quartet jazz. So at a couple of the functions that they had for the senior class, he'd bring his quartet in and they had bright red jackets and they'd dress up. And what was the eighth grade teacher, the gal? She was a little tiny gal. I have no idea. I can't remember because I didn't have her class. And he would have the jazz band playing this stuff. And she played a piano, honky tonk style. And she would dance the jitterbug with class, some of the class mates and it's so grade school was great for me i mean I, there were some other teachers mrs summers was one she's the one who took the baseball back to you yeah yeah i didn't mind her and mr baldwin he got in fight what well i don't know he got a fight he was just he's just stubborn and she took a baseball back and hit him upside the head mr baldwin i made a, made some bombs and took him to school it's, you know, the jurisdiction's got to be over me getting in trouble. We would take uh, match heads and chop them off and pack them into a maraschino cherry bottle because, gosh, it took like two of those big old boxes. and took days. And then Dad worked at Aerojet at that time, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of duct tape. You know, they'd bring home partial rolls, and we'd wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. And you'd put Jet X fuel in it. Do you guys, do you remember Jet X rockets? Well, you just went with the end group. <laughs> so, and that's what we'd use for the fuse. And before school started, everybody went there early because we'd hang out, you know, at jungle gyms and you'd lag marbles to see who could, you know, win largles. A couple guys had set up quarters and if you knocked the quarter down, you got it. You know, early gambling. And... Me and Joe Kelly and probably Steve Bacon, we set that off underneath the jungle gym and it went boom, blew all the bark out, <laughs> blew every bit of the bark out. And it was kind of a cold day and there was this huge cloud of smoke that went really slow. You know, the teachers came out and looked and we're going, wow, what was that? <laughs> 
we made it we made it to the second <laughs> class. <Maybe> they knew. <laughs> second period class and over the intercom it was Mr. Lynn, he's gone. I want Joe Kelly and Jim Culbertson in my office right now. <laughs> so we go up there and we're we're scared spitless. And we're standing there just shaking and he goes, Now I know you boys like to play with fireworks, but you can't bring them to school. And that was it. He let us go. So You're lucky. <laughs> well, it's a long time ago. There was nobody out here. Yeah. Nobody there was did. nothing out here. You know. And besides, when we got to be, I don't know, nine, ten, when we got our bikes, then we were down at the river. Because we were here. Were you guys been here long enough before they, on the end of the Lincoln Cut, before they cut the mountain down on that side? Nope, you guys weren't here. Well, that mountain used to be the same height as it is on the other side. Yeah. And they had a tunnel through it for the road, and we could ride our bikes up on top of there. And we just sit up there and watch everything go by. And then you could shoot down across and go up to where the they put that rock stuff in where that rock company was at. And then you could ride the critter trails all the way down to the down to the bottom. Because down at the bottom, back then, that was still I believe a functioning scale and stuff when they were building the dam. Because the trucks came down there to get material. On that Lincoln Cut, that's where the bridge crosses... Orangeville Avenue where it goes over the little bridge. There was a bridge before the concrete bridge. Do you remember that? Nope. No. It was a metal bridge. Nope. Well, that, the only metal bridge was the one... Was the next, one they put up over the river. Over the river. It's rainbow. The one they rainbow. put back in for the... I, we see, we've seen a picture of a truss bridge um, over the Orangeville bridge, Orangeville Avenue. Not, I've you know, never seen it. 52 wasn't here. Oh, we've never seen it. Way early. Yeah, Cause, no, we, cause I think that bridge was put is in. my earliest days here. I think I remember seeing a date on that little bridge was 18. I don't remember. They That used to be the it. Highway 40 road. You know, it was the, the Lincoln, Lincoln Memorial. Highway. There used to be granite uh, ovalis that had a, a D ring or a ring on the top to tie your horse up to it, and there was a big brass insert in it with Lincoln's picture. What happened to it? They all were stolen. Oh. <laughs> what do you think would happen to it? <laughs> if I'd known they were going to steal them, I'd have stole one. So when I was too young. <laughs> but we'd ride down to the park, and then right there were. Smith Art had the plumbing things. Eventually, that turned into a market who was owned by uh, Mr. Huggins. Wasn't it, was his name first Roy too? Anyway, we'd gather up yeah. soda bottles. You didn't have to go, go far to get those. You know, down along the river, and Mr. Huggins was, he wouldn't charge us the deposit, deposit if we drank it in front of the store. So we could go in there and trade the bottles in for sodas, and he'd open them. We'd sit outside and drink them and just give him back the bottles. So it was, no, we it's didn't. A deal. Yeah, we used to ride right straight out across there through the Benning apartments and everything. That was our shortcut. You know, we had a. Except you had to go by Mr. Merriweather because he'd shoot at us. Well, yeah, whoever the guy was that was next to the. Where they Merriweather, put in the, him and his wife, they were. Oh. Uh, uh, ornery. He had electric I, fences up. Yeah, he, he, he wasn't so much ornery. I think he was uh, a little know. disturbed. Yeah, he could have been mentally off because mentally, he was I mentally offset. Through there, and I thought somebody hit me in the back with something. Well, it was a shock from the fence. I didn't know what an electric fence was, so we got one of the other guys to pee on it, and it almost killed him. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kids. <laughs> yeah. We don't have snow where you can lick, you know, stick somebody's <laughs> tongue to the bowl. We and we knew better when we moved out here. But yeah, you got to remember when we moved here, there was nothing here. You know, there's the only house was here was the one on the other side of me. No, the one on the corner. Yeah, it's been remodeled, so you don't remember on the yeah north uh, west corner, the corner. one down in the the hole hole there. And then this white house right across the here, white house, the two story. It was here, and then there was nothing except for a house on top of the hill, which is really the end of Rocky Lane. Yeah. Because he then, lived on Rocky uh, Lane for a while. What's your name? The, the Patterson House. Patterson House, then across the street. The second the street. house, one, two, third house, 
on the north side, the Patterson house was here. He was an insurance agent. No, Mr. Dewey Ron, Sweet. Ron Patterson. Yeah, Ron. Oh, Ronnie, yeah. yeah. Did you find him? Motorcycle. Do you know him? I used to hang around with him. Oh, he's, well, he's so in the house next to him. Oh, yeah. Up there? Yes. Huh. Him and his rattlesnakes? Or, you know, him he, and his rattlesnakes? He doesn't uh, know he about the rattlesnakes. Oh, you don't know about his rattlesnakes? I hold him to the hospital when he crashed at Honda Hills. We used to ride out there. Well, I hold a lot of people over there. He crashed several times. Well, one time just for me. But he got too crazy when we were little and he moved on to probably your group. I he don't went, know. He went around that corner there at Orangeville Avenue in Maine back when it was a circular road yeah. going east. And he didn't make it. That wouldn't surprise me. Well, have you heard from him in the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years. Last time I saw him was at least 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Back when Mel still had the tire store, and my partner in the race car was Gary Rodiger, was Rodiger Brothers Concrete. He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I used to go to school with Rodiger. I don't know. They were all older than me. Really? You, well, it depends on which family. Okay. This was Gary, Eddie, uh, Lance, not Lance, was that was a cousin. That was a cousin. Uh, Boyd. And uh, the great big one. What the hell Eddie, was it? You said Eddie, right? Oh, yeah, Eddie. That was Eddie. Mm. So there were one class behind you at Bella Vista. Oh, you were one you, class behind me? I was 68. Yeah. You were probably, what was the Rodiger we went to school with? It was probably one of his brothers. Oh, that would have been, well, the crazy one there was uh, well, Rob the Bank of America. Yeah, with my friend's Dale's sister. sister. She was the getaway driver. I can't remember what was his name. I don't know. I he stole remember. from everybody in the family. He and stole he, from everybody and anybody. And he was a Rodiger? Oh, yep. gosh. There's, there was a lot of Rodigers out there. Most of the Rodigers were in Fair Oaks. They all, you know. And, and there's big families, Leslie, like four big families. Yeah, Leslie, I think there were four of the original brothers. Yeah. He was a highway patrolman. His son was killed in Vietnam. He was a helicopter pilot. Uh... And then what was the thief's name that lived down there on Orangeville Avenue? He was a cousin of them. But half of them were sort of okay and half of them were just terrible. Yeah, you just, there were fewer good than, than there was bad. But yeah, I, they were all crazy. Yeah, they totally didn't have a crazy. Look sense. No, he poured, worries. when we lived in the house next door, dad built that house over there. I built the shop. Dad said, if you want a shop to build your cars in, you've got to pay for it. So I got the permits and everything, and we built it. And when I, he talked me into being his partner. There's, I don't know, there's probably a picture of the car. There's a, this? Nope. Keep going down. These are military pictures. No, that's oh, me wait, in the wait. Army. There you go. There's, there should be one in there with a body on it. There it is. Yeah. Hmm. He's in partners with me with that one. And who's he? Gary Rodiger. Okay. He was one of the partners. Of, it was Rodiger and Rodiger Concrete. So. It, it had a blown <laughs> fuel motor in it. He was the motor and I made everything else. Sand drags? Yep. You go all the way out to the beach to do that? Or you? Well, they had them down in Isleton. Oh. And they had them down... Uh, down along the river, down by Reed Avenue by the High Patrol. They'd go down in there and clean up a big section and mm. put in a track. And Bakersfield was the biggest place. Bakersfield was huge. We'd get a 32-car feet in top fuel. <laughs> oh, super money was down there. One year, the Army, Army car showed up. Yeah, I mean, it was a big deal. Yeah, he spent a ton of money. I still worked at Sheets Welding. I didn't make any money. But I could build this stuff. So, Jerry, do you have any uh, crimes to report from your uh, elementary school years? Other None than, that I can remember. Other than setting the field on fire? 
No, not well, really. Well, when he got older. He didn't hang out with us. I he, didn't hang with him. He wanted to stay in the house. I wanted to stay in the house and stay cool. We would ride all the way. You might remember when you'd go down Douglas, almost into Roseville, where it had the war shout and everybody shot their guns. Were you here when they were still doing that? Well, probably about where, I don't know, where Kaiser is and then go back. Oh, the rifle shot place? Yeah, I don't know, back in there. But anybody went out there and shot their guns. And we'd ride our bikes all the way over there yeah. to dig the slugs out of the dirt to shoot them in our slingshots. Get the slugs, yeah. God, it almost killed us riding yeah. over there. I remember Douglas being a two-way street. Yep, that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then when they decided to make it four-lane and develop it, they couldn't get equipment in there big enough. To it had to be somewhere that. near uh, Roseville Road. Oh, no, it's down there. Or is it farther, closer it's to town? It's probably closer to where Kaiser was, but on, it could have been. on the south side of the road because all the water came off of there and cut this wash in. And it, I don't know, it was probably 10 or 15 feet high bank, and everybody just shot because, you know, there was you a You could go out there, there and shoot, nobody... Nobody, nobody bothered anybody. you. Nobody bothered us kids. The Hell's Angels, you know, Orangeville was full of Hell's Angels. I've heard that. I've heard that... Um there, that there, there's a family, I guess, that is still around here that's... I don't know if any of them still alive. Well... It was the Owens. Oh. Kenny Owens, or was it Jerry? Well, I don't know. There were two brothers. Two brothers. And their mom went to our church. And they had a sister. And uh, one of them turned out was a carpenter, and the other one was the enforcer for the Hells Angels, and I think is also the president. Well, he was the president before... Of this chapter. Yeah, this chapter of Orangeville. But they watched out for the kids. I used to ride around in his hot rod, had no seats in the back. Me and a guy named Virgil Ramsey, that used to live right up on Main, and we'd, have to, we'd hang on to the roll bar. Because Sheets lived right over there, and before he opened his shop, he did all this work at home. So, you know, there was cars and motorcycles and tractors and boats. <laughs> heaven so we'd watch all this stuff going on and you know he was probably still only four or five years older than us but you know when you're in a kid that's like a couple acres but you know we'd ride getting his i think it was a 55 and he put a giant pontiac engine in it and we'd hang on to the roll bar while he raced around <laughs> so yeah you uh when you were in school, in uh, high school, you played on sports teams? <laughs> I went out for football and they beat the snot out of me because I was so little. So you gave up on that? No, I made it the whole season, got bronchitis twice. They near killed me. <laughs> well, we'd had our tonsils out that summer before. And that was terrible. It was for me. It didn't bother him much. No, it didn't bother me a bit. But, I mean, I woke up and it was like four pieces of aspergum before I could even get my mouth open. You know, suck on it and let it go down through there. It was terrible. So, Jerry, were you in any sports? No. Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> I knew better. Well, well, did you have any activities in high school? Well, I think the only activity I had was probably my senior year. We'd go to the the bar while the school would play and drink beer. <laughs> I didn't drink beer. Well, I we'd got go to drafted. Townhouse, Folsom, or Fair Oaks. We all had fake IDs, and we'd all walk in there and we'd drink for a few hours, and we'd stop by at the school, find out what the score was. We'd be be home by eleven, and my day. folks would look at the TV because back then all the school g games were reported. Oh, yeah, it was 38 to 12. We stopped it on. Oh, Dad oh, okay. If Dad had ever caught you, he'd have beat your ass until you couldn't have walked. I stumbled back into the bedroom. And Actually, Mom was the enforcer. Well, Dad worked at nights when he worked at Dad, yards. Yeah, he was swing shift. And Mom used a wire handled fly swatter. Ooh. Man, it left welts. Welts. Double rows of welts. She hung onto the dead fly end and beat us with a wire. She chased us through the house that one time. What did you we do? Couldn't get, out, couldn't get out of the house quick enough. <laughs> no, we probably sassed her. Oh, yeah, and we were. She wailed on us. Oh, man, if they had done it today, I, one time I had welts from my knees 
up partially on my back. Two little red lights everywhere. You probably deserved every one of them, too. Yep, we earned them. And then she says, well, your dad gets home. Well, dad get home about midnight or 1 o'clock, depending on what happened. And he was just too tired. He didn't care. Did mom take care of it? Look at my legs. You're lucky she didn't do more. <laughs> but dad made us work. There's no free ride at this house. No. What, what kind of work? I put a sprinkler system in when I was 10 years old in that house. He showed me how to cut the pipe and thread it. I had to dig the ditch by hand. Of course, now there was only two sprinklers on it, but it took me half the summer to get that done. Mom would come out and help me when he was gone digging. Pulling weeds? Yeah, we had, this was a full acre. And in the summer, we had a berry bramble down there like most every place had. And that was just totally miserable because we'd, shine it on until the weekend and then when dad got home nope out there was sickles and i think we tried to burn it one time we did we burned it twice we set it on <laughs> fire dad set the field on fire but it, on Bob those, back there. those berries had just come back the next year with a vengeance <laughs> until the time that he uncovered a bumblebee nest couldn't run oh, fast gosh, enough. they came out and i heard them and they come, I go, Dad, the bumblebees are coming. And he's going, what? I go, bumblebees, Dad. And he's standing there. The one goes, bazwat. The time he got to the house, he had 14 or 15 bites. Oh, or he had big welts all over him. Oh, he had bumps everywhere on his. He looked like he had eggs coming out of him. Out came the cigarettes. The tobacco was packed all over him. And... <laughs> yeah, baking soda and tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> well, that was before you had all the new trick of the week, you know animal things this was got to remember you got a farmer here you know but, i mean now you're yeah this is what happened this was you know we had chores all the time there was no allowance you mowed the yards because you lived here yeah and i remember watching tv when we were over there somebody some kid sued their parents for being abused and i went to dad and i said now you're in trouble he says, you better pack your suitcase, kid. He says, because you'll be out the door. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Farmers. If he said it, he meant it, too. Yeah, um, I'll skip ahead a little bit. You want me to tell you about the day I got out of the Army? Well, first of all, uh, you were drafted right out of high school? No, I made it one year. I went to AR, but I'm a dummy in school. I can't hardly read or write. Well, it turns out I'm dyslexic. But nobody knew what that was back then. But college was actually easier in high school because the teachers don't care. And then the ones I had trouble with was English because they wanted you to write all this big old long things. You know, my, I turned them in there before lines. And the guy would go, you were supposed to analyze, and this is true. He took us outside and there was a bunch of gopher holes. And he says, now I want you to write about that gopher hole. It's a hole that a gopher made. That's what I put down. What, what else do you, you know, how do you, what do you, you know, these people, some of them had this giant dissertation about all this stuff, and I'm going, you got all that from a gopher hole? I got a D. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you were drafted and served. Uh, Hurry. You were yeah. in Korea? Nope. Viet we, were, we were drafted for oh, Vietnam. Vietnam, okay. Yep. Did before you serve? Number? No, I was before that. They didn't have numbers then. No, what they did is anybody that was... Alive and breathing. I was 18, I guess, and it started. And first you go down for a physical. That's and it. all your doctors are some other nationality and nobody speaks English. Or some young guy that doesn't care. And you go through... You just... You actually followed the yellow brick road. They had lines painted and on lines the floor. Around, yeah. Yellow, yes. red, green, and blue. blue. And ours was yellow. It was the golden. That's what we called it. I think they were for the four different services. And so we went down for the physical, and of course you passed. And I, I was all screwed up. I got a spine that looks like a lizard. If it was straight, I'd be four inches taller. <laughs> 
then I, mom says, you're taking all these things down because I threw my back out in high school and I was in physical therapy for two years. At least. You know, and I had x-rays that showed all this stuff. So she says, you, when you go down again, you take that with you. Okay, but I don't think it'll do any good. And so we, I went to AR and I had to go five days a week and two nights a week to, and I still only got 12 units because if you're a brainiac you can take one hour class and get three units and if you're a dummy you take a shop class and you got three hours of shop and one hour and you get one credit so <laughs> you see how this is working out you needed what I think it was 14 to have a full thing and so that just didn't work out and my counselor was my psychology teacher. And of course, everything there, you gotta write all the answers out. And she finally pulled me in and she says, you spell like an eighth grader. And I go, what's the problem? She says, you spell like an eighth grader, your penmanship is terrible. And I go, well, yeah, but you're missing the point where my answer's right. And she goes, well, that's not the question. And I go, what do you mean it's not? If you get the answer right, you get the answer right. And she was so mad, I think she's the one that turned me into the draft. <laughs> <laughs> I think she canceled me because I was drafted in July. And, and then the next time you went, all that stuff that she said to take, I left at home because you go straight to the induction center and they ship you out. We went down there. I think there were 1,500 people from Sacramento went down the day that I got drafted. Ronnie Stewart was one of my classmates. He went down that day. And one of the guys from college, a guy named Mendoza out of Cortland, he was there. So they just, you know, they took you all. And you just went down there, and when it came to the, the tests, like colorblind, you ever taken that test, the book with all the dots? All I see is dots. I can't. But you passed. Perfect. I was perfect. <laughs> the guy goes, give me a guess. And I go, maybe eight. Oh, yeah, that's good. You're, okay. And he, he, he went down. And I got to the doctors again. And these were all some kind of Pacific Rim, you know, and nobody spoke English. Nothing. He go, you fine. And then they'd line you up. They'd put four guys at a time. You'd stand up. And they'd come down and go, Marine, Marine, Army, Navy. And that's how you, I was Army. I prayed not to be Navy. I don't want to be out in the water. You can't walk on water. Sharks, you got in the water, you're bait. So... And then from there, we went straight to the airport, Oakland, and went up to SeaTac to Seattle and went to Fort Lewis. Terribly scary for kids. I mean it. I was a bunch, everybody in our unit was from California. We had six guys from Oakland area, and they were all gang members. And they all had the option of going in the military, going to jail. <laughs> and a couple of them looked like tree trunks. There was one guy named Gilmer. Him and I were side by side through everything. It turned out, he turned out to be a really nice guy. But he's the one that told me the story. And we got off the bus and they had these guys that looked like that boxer. They were huge. They must have been seven foot tall three feet wide I mean they were monsters and they lined us up along the bus we came in on and he goes now now he goes if you're carrying anything that could hurt me you're to take it out and put it on the ground we're going to ship it back to your mommy they didn't well I took a straight razor I didn't know that was evil because I'd been learning to shave with it and these guys dropped brass knuckles and switch blades <laughs> And by the time they left that bus, every one of those gang members were quivering just like we were. And then you go straight from there 
into these big buildings where you take aptitude tests. And you sit down and they give you an aptitude test. And I'm sitting next to a guy that, God, he looked like he was 50 years old. And I said, did you get drafted? He goes, no, I had to come back in. Well, he killed some guy in a bar fight, in manslaughter. It, you know, and it wasn't his fault, but that was the options he was given. And he goes, I've already done this once. He goes, now when you fill out that test, he says, if it says, do you like camping? He says, you put out no. And he told me all this stuff. And he goes, you like radios? And I go, no. He goes, okay, you'll do fine on that one. And I think there was five of them or seven, I don't remember. And when they got all done, I passed three of them. They were all mechanical things. And the guy says, you don't like to do anything else, huh? I go, no, sir. And he says, what do you want to do? I said, I want to drive a tank. <laughs> he goes, well, where do you want to go? And I said, California. This is a wrong answer, too. <laughs> but yeah, that's how that goes. But basic sucked. I mean, they, they do all kinds of stuff, too. Not like they do. And there's no timeouts. Now they give guys timeouts. So, uh, so you served in Vietnam? Nope. They took me straight out of basic, no AIT, which is advanced infantry training. And I went and became a mechanic in the combat engineers. And they gave, they took three of us. Actually, they took four guys out of our unit. One, they turned into a clerk, but they shipped him to Germany. But the other two guys and I, they gave us critical MOSs and made us wheeled vehicle mechanics because they had nobody to work on anything. And we were in a motor pool that supported the combat engineers. And where was that? Missouri. <laughs> Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. That's another toilet. Oh. It's terrible there. They got bugs. Every bug bites. I've never seen cockroaches so big. They had cockroaches, they were that long. They were big enough they could carry a roll of toilet paper off. <laughs> so, Jerry, uh, did you serve? No. No, I was drafted four times. On my fourth time, they looked at me and said, we're sending you home. And I says, why? He says, you're junk. That's what they did. You're junk. You can't junk. Help. So I failed. I got drafted. And just like he says, when you get you drafted back then and... Uh, First thing you do is you fill it out some paperwork or taking some test, and next thing you know, you're you know you're in line in your skivvies, and you're out there giving you shots and running you through this building down in Oakland. And uh, it's a beauty. It's a beauty. It's I mean it's in the scum of the earth part of town. And uh, <laughs> yeah, if they thought everybody carried lunchtime guns came along and they gave us all a little piece of paper which says go down two blocks to the right and three blocks, whatever, you know. And it's just all this homeless or anything. We're all going, you're kidding me. You want us, you know? So you're in the military. You don't care. And we ended up going down there and get some lousiest food that probably could be served. And we came back and they went through all this. and I didn't get it. Uh -huh. I said, I didn't get any food when I went down there. Uh, they gave us food. And, and at the end of the, we went through psychological things, and I watched all these guys walk around in panties, and I had just, it was un, I had stuff I had never seen before, let alone thought of. Wear panties, and you, they don't take you, but they know you did it just to get out of it. Yeah, so and you know, anyway, they all ended up back panties. in the same room, and they, they lined them up in threes. And the sergeant would go, Army, Marines, Navy. And he had told me a long time ago that if you went into the Navy, you were going to be a medic for the Marines, which would mean you go to the front lines. That's what happened to Joe Kelly. And he died over there. And Sniper I got Army three out of three. The fourth, I didn't get that far. But I had to go down every time, and they went through the same thing. And like that color test, you walk on, and you know how gyms have these, I still remember these, lockers where you sit down on and you walk up there they flash these cards you're supposed to say what color and then you go blue 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 purple 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 and it didn't make a bit I of didn't, difference didn't get any of that stuff 
went right on through and, and I came home, called dad up and says, you know, they don't want me right now. He says, well, what are, you, what are they going to do? They're going to bring you back? He says, yeah, in a couple of days. He says, I'll be down. Yeah, dad's one that told me, don't. He was in the South Pacific. Yeah. And, and two, and he, he just told me, he says, with your attitude, you're going to be in trouble. Don't. Because all, all my friends all went in the Marines under the buddy system. You know, so I was thinking about it, and he goes, no, don't do that. What will they take you? He says, because no matter what they tell you, it'll work out whatever they want it to work out as. So uh, did you return home to Orangevale after the service? Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and... What were your goals? None. <laughs> did you... You found work. Just, I just wanted to get out of there. I went back to work for Sheets Welding. I'd worked there the summer before I got drafted. And he really had to take me back unless he could prove, you know, it was part of the, you got drafted, so you get to go back there. He probably could have worked me a couple of weeks and then sent me home. But I turned out to be really good at what I did. So how long did you work there? Ten years until his kid got old enough and I could see the writing on the wall. And then a crane company hired me out of there. I quit before I got fired or laid off. I went for to work for the company that did that. Were you <laughs> welding over sheets? Oh, yeah. But I worked for him for a year before he'd let me weld. Oh, he was German. He was terrible. <laughs> Guy yelled at me nonstop. I'm surprised you didn't hear him at your house. <laughs> mm. he, he wanted me to learn to hollow grind chisels. And I'd, I'd spend at least an hour every day. No, I don't like that. Until I got him hollow ground to meet his standards. Same with sharpening drill bits. Oh, no, he was terrible picky. Huge picky. I worked for him a year. My first job, I welded a lawnmower handle back together. If you could scream the loudest you could scream. That's the way Walt talked. That's the way Walt talked at a normal base. When he'd go outside, you could hear him. <laughs> like he was right beside you. And he was, just he was really a good guy, but I mean... Yeah, he just, he just would, had a... Later on, they'd go, how can you stand to work for that guy? He's yelling at you all the time. And I go, no, that's just him normal. I go, that's just... That's the way he is. He, that's what he does with everything. He starts throwing stuff when he gets older. <laughs> he gets, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're, was Sheets Welding ever an entry in the Powwow Days Parade? Oh, well, no, Hal well, wrote... Maybe later, after I wasn't there. Yeah, Hal we wrote a... That uh, little tin building behind, next yeah, to the vet, and whatever the... Behind the furniture store. Yeah, behind the furniture store. That was Sheets Welding. Yeah. And that was all open. He made a, a cow, a metal cow, that actually would brock on springs, and he made Hal ride it during the powwow days. But see, he would never close. We worked Saturdays, and he'd get so mad at them because they'd block the road down there, and nobody could come right. into the business. And I wanted him to close because I didn't want to work on Saturday. But, yeah, so I don't know about that. But, yeah, he just yelled and screamed. And if he was like that now, he'd be in jail. He threw a hammer once and hit the door of a car. Great big hammer. It was a bunch of kids came in on Saturday, and they had their dad's brand new International with a granny speed transmission. You don't know what that is. It's a four speed, but in low gear it goes about that fast. And they were in front of the main door, and I'm talking to them. I said, "I can't repair your wheel. Not today. Well, look, we're too busy. We had a gas tanker. We built the first USA gas stations. You remember them when they first came to town? We built. We mounted the tanks and." did all the repair and stuff down there. Mm. And we had one of those in there working on it, and I told him, you just can't do it. And these kids jumped in the truck and they threw it in reverse, and it threw gravel into the shop. And Wally was working under the tanker, and man, he'd come out. Who did that? Who did that? And he's got a short-handled beater. I mean, a big one. It must have been a 10-pounder. And he goes, these kids are backing up, and then they, the kid puts it in the wrong gear to go forward. He puts it in granny. And he's revving it up, and it's throwing, oh, it's throwing rocks all over Wally's parking lot. And he's screaming at him, and they're, they're all freaked out. And all of a sudden, he lets go of that hammer. 
and you can hear it. It's going, and the guy that owned the tank line trucks, his name was Fry, and he goes, did he throw that hammer? I says, can you hear it? And it's going, and Fry looked at me, and he turned away. He says, I don't want to be a witness. <laughs> and it hit the door right smack dab in the middle of the door and put a dent in there. It must have been that deep. And Walt's out in the dirt yelling at him, trying. He's still trying to catch him. And I'm going, oh, God. He didn't back down. And when the, I go, what are those kids going to tell their dad? He'll be back down here. Never heard a word. Those kids must have lied their asses off to get out of that. But that was excitement down there. It was like that all the time. So, uh, Jerry, after high school, what did you do? I was went to work for Lucky Stores. Here locally? I, uh, well, actually, I worked in the Jimco division, and I worked in all three of their Sacramento stores for a while. And then I did that for almost 10 years, and I they wanted me to move up the chain and go to San Jose. And I says, no, I'm not going to San Jose. If you want me to stay, that's fine. He says, if you stay, you'll never go up. If you don't do what we want you to do, you'll never succeed. So he was like he was in the Army. And I says, very well. So I quit, and I bought a service station down Howard Northrop. And I worked it for about a year, year and a half. Until they bought the service station and tore it down. No, they, I sold it. Well, yeah, but as soon as you were out of there, they tore it down. As soon as I was out of it, they, 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 they tore it down, building. yeah. Because uh, I was a crane operator by then, I worked on it. I bought the Texaco station, which was at Greenback in Illinois. Then it went to, uh, switched over to Exxon. And I was there for about 20 years. And then they took it away from me. Uh, they said, no, we don't want you here. Because I probably wasn't the easiest person to work with. Uh, you know, they called me Walt a lot. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, big corporations, they have really some dumb ideas. You know, and they want you to do the third way. And then... You know, they always were trying to get me to lower my price of gas and cut my profit down. And, and I says, you know, can you live on this much money and pay? You know, at that time back then, that was in uh, 91, 92, uh, rent was at uh, almost $9,000 a month. That's a lot of money back then. You tell them how you had to pay cash for your gas. Oh, yeah, you had to pay cash for gas. There's no credibility. So you had to watch your dollar all the time. So in uh, 1990, I bought the Greenback Rentals. And I was there until it just recently sold, uh, what, a year and a half ago or so. I sold it to a family operation up out of Chico. And since then, I've do absolutely nothing. You're happily retired? No, I, you know, I don't know about happily. My health isn't that great. I can't go and do anything because I fall over. My legs are bothered. You know, I have some real health issues. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to pour his driveway solid so I can bring the forklift in to pick him up when he yeah, falls. Yeah, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's, it's no fun getting old. It really isn't. When you mm -hmm. face some of these things, you know, these uh, uh, challenging things that you think th you took for granted for years. And all of a sudden, you can't walk up the staircase. Like steps. You know, I can't, you know, I, my lungs are so bad, probably from the, the station or the chemicals at the rental yard. Even, you know, I have to have my lawn mowed. I don't mow it because I, not only I couldn't walk it, I couldn't breathe long enough to do it. So you learn to pick your battles again. Did you enjoy having greenback rents? That was a very challenging yeah, he, business. He sat on his ass up there <laughs> and sat behind the counter. It seems to me the whole community went in there. I know we did. It is, it's so challenging because it was so different than what I 
new as far as running a business. You know, because being with Lucky Stories, I learned so much in the business world, you know, and there it was not so much running the business. You had to be a tax advisor because you, you're working off tax credits, you know, sales tax credits, uh, federal tax credits, income tax credits. You know, all these tax credits are working and buying stuff and how to save your money to use your tax credits to pay your taxes so you make less. And it was really difficult for me. And then fighting all the government agencies. That was probably the worst. Because uh, I had a very good accountant, I still have him, that was, I could call him up and he would explain and tell me, you know, good insight on what to do and what not to do. But to fight the local and federal government Oh, it's, that's horrible. You know, these people, they treat you like you're the scum of the earth and you're paying their wages for them and they don't even understand what they're doing. They don't have a clue what they're they doing. They have a, you know, state water board, storm drain, all these people, they have no idea what they're doing. I had storm drain come in one time because we had that batch plant. We sold concrete. We had a wash off area that contained all the water. It drained, it filtered into another pool, and you could clean it and take care of it. And the guy goes, you know, that's not pliable now. And I says, yeah, it's federal law. It's pliable. Look it up. I kick him off the lot. Of course, you, you don't kick these people off your lot because they remember it. And they'd come back and uh, said, oh, no, here with all these laws. And he goes, well, what do you want to see? Well, we want to contain where all this stuff can flow up and drain off so it can make all these collections and you can clean it up and, and everything. And I says, what are you talking about? A septic tank. So I got a hold of my son's <coughs> best friend is a civil engineer. And he's one of the smartest people I've ever known. And he helped me design a deal that would do just what I would do. It collected all the water, it sifted down so you could clean it out, and it would drift into different stages and drift, and then the clean water would go back into the earth as uh, clean water for water storage into the shed. He comes out there and he goes, he goes, how's this work? And I told him. He says, well, you know what I would do? And I'd cut that front wall out of there so that water gets out and can run across the driveway. And that was what he got me for to begin with. So all this work I spent on the concrete, my time, my labor, my co general contractor I had helped me do all this. You know, I put about $50,000 in this thing. And he wants me to cut it open just like it was. I said, what are you, an idiot? No, they're stupid. They are stupid. And then I, I, I called the rental association up because I found that he was talking out on seminars to other locations in California how to do this for their deals. And I called him up, cancel him. This guy, he's an idiot. He doesn't even know what he's doing. I did something way surpassing what he was, and he couldn't understand how it worked. I had another, another guy that was in another division and the same part of it where the wastewater would go into, it is a septic tank. It'd catch all the heavy stuff, the water would rise. Yeah, the solids and the clear comes out. Clear comes out, goes into the sewage, goes down for treatment. He didn't know what that was. No, I'll skip ahead. When I quit working for the crane company, I went into business for myself. That didn't work. Product liability insurance. 10000 the first year, 20000 the second year. I went, no way. I didn't say it exactly like that. But I went to work for S&K Steel, and I was a shop foreman. It was my job to deal with the people he's talking about. Where's S&K Steel? It's on Florin Perkins. Okay. It's probably one of the last steel places, and it's open to the public. You can walk through the whole building and look at everything. And... Uh, I would get environmental people there, and they would come in and tell me, just like that, they'd look at the equipment, and they look at the shear, and she says, 
why is there a catch pan over here with rags in it? And I said, because this is a positive discharge system. Well, what does that mean? I said, well, every time you tromp on the pedal, a drop of oil falls on the shaft. And then it rolls around and then it drips off. There's no containment. She says, I want you to recycle that and run it back through the machine. And I said, absolutely not. I stuck my finger under there and I pulled it up and I said, do you see all that brass? She goes, yeah. I said, let's put that in your car. Well, I don't understand this. And I said, well, okay, this is an old machine. Well, what she doesn't understand is all of these big mechanical shears are made exactly the same as they were made back in the 40s. The design hasn't changed. They use the same oilers, shafts, everything. They just don't make them as roundy because it costs more to cut them. So we had a big new one back there, a bigger one, and I got all these cover plates and I opened it all up and I got in there and I looked and I went, oh look, well I won't tell you what I told her. I said, those guys are stupid back there. They made it just like that old one. And she, oh, she was furious with me. And so I took her back up to our plasma cutter and it had it looked like antifreeze in this giant tank. And what it does is when you cut the parts out, plasma makes all the smoke, all kinds of stuff. I think it vaporizes the metal. I don't, still don't know exactly how it works. But the, it's made with uh, sodium salts, the same stuff they put in food to preserve it. And it's to stop mosquitoes from laying eggs and bugs and the smell. And she's seen that and went absolutely crazy. I go, Here's your sheet. Well, I don't think that's right. I go, well, I'm sorry, but there's the sheet. And then we go over to the saws, and the same thing. We had a, a saw lubricant made by uh, Lennox Saw, and it was called Band-Aid. Absolutely no restrictions on it other than you couldn't ship it on an airplane. And I finally just took her in the office and passed her off to... The, it was a husband and wife ex on the company. And the wife, she was in charge of the office and he's in charge of everything else. But that's how, that's how they are. And the same with one guy came by, like he said, it's raining. And he pulls into our yard and he's from environmental protection. And he comes into the office and he goes, well, who's in charge? And that day the boss was actually there. And I go, you got it, Sarge. You talk to him. And he goes, I want to know what you're doing to catch all that oil. And Sarge looked at me and I go to the guy, I go, what oil? What are you talking about? This is red iron, like buildings go up. There's nothing there with oil on it. And he goes, well, off all those car parts. And Sarge and I look at each other like we're stupid. And I go, what car parts? And Sarge goes, there's no car parts out here. It's just steel. It's all raw steel. And he goes, well, isn't this a wrecking yard? That's your tax dollars at work. <laughs> I had probably right down the street from Blue Collar Supply. Yeah, which is no longer there. Right. Yeah, just had, over the railroad tracks. I had a problem with the fire department. Fire department came in. Oh, they're stupid. Went through, went through the building looking for anything that they could possibly find. And then finally he walks out to the gate that we pulled closed. And he goes, where's your Knox box? And I says, okay, you got me. What is a Knox box? He says, I want a box on here, welded on here, that's got a lock on it so we can come in here can gain access. in case of a fire. And I says, well, if there's a case of a fire here, you can take my shiny red truck and you drive it through the gates. He says, oh, no, we got to have that box where we can open the gates. I says, no, you don't. And they almost sued me for it, and I sh showed him the print of the law on it. That's only if it's occupied. So you see all these grocery stores, and, and all these people that have Knox boxes, a little black box, and it's got a little round key deal. It opens up, has a store to the building. So any kid could take a crowbar and whack it, get the key, and go in into the building. Well, that's only if it has residents living there. But, I don't know how many Taco Bells have people living in them. Maybe out there, around but, them, but not in them. 
Well, yeah, but the fire chief can also change the law. He doesn't have to follow it. Because I got into it with our welders. I hardwired the welders because they're big. And they ran, you know, 220, 125 amp service. A lot of electricity. And he wanted me to put plugs on them. And I told him, absolutely not. I said, why would you want us to put a plug on there when they're hardwired so there's a connection to electrocute people? He says, because I said so. And I said, well, I'm not doing it. I said, you can go back in and talk to the owner. I said, but he pretty much told me what he wanted. No, they come in like that. That steel company, I think, has 16 fire extinguishers. What good is one? There's nothing flammable in the building. It's all steel. The only thing that's flammable is the hydraulic oil in three machines. I had, a, I think it was 16 different agencies looking over at me. This is that greenback rents? Mm -hmm. Oh dear. No, see, and, and paperwork up to Kazoo. And you just couldn't imagine all the stuff that go in there. And these people are a lot smarter than I ever thought about being. Except they're stupid when it comes to But they have no common sense. You know, if the all building, these forms and these calculations. If the building caught on fire when they were in there, they'd all die. Because they'd stare at the ceiling. I'm, just, I'm not... I'm not impressed. And they don't know anything. They don't know anything. Uh, all, all, all these stories about the places you you worked, all this time did you live in Orangevale? Yeah. Well, I lived in Folsom for 20 years uh -huh. and in Missouri for a couple. <laughs> Loved that. So uh, when did you move back to Orangevale? After uh, my dad died. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll go back and tell you the story about when I got out of the Army. Dad and Mom picked me up, took me down to Epimondis, right there by the, uh, oh, the concert hall, Memorial Auditorium. Yeah. And I had, I took my last bite, and Dad looked at me and he says, "What are you going to do now?" And I said, "Go home, aren't we? We're done eating." No, 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 no. That's not what the question is. He says, "What are you going to do about work?" And then I said, "Well, I hadn't thought about it." I go, "Jesus, Dad, I only been out of the army like six hours." He goes, well, what are you thinking about? And I go, well, I don't know. He says, well, here's what's going to happen. He says, you got two weeks. He says, if you go to school, you can live here free. He says, or you can get a job and you can still live here, but you're going to pay mom rent. And I go, the third? He goes, get out. <laughs> and I go, and I've got two weeks, and he goes, yeah. And so I said, okay. And I finally settled on, I'll pay mom rent. And I go, how much is that going to be? And way back then, he charged me 100 bucks a month. And you could have got an apartment for 50 But I would have lost my garage space and tools. So that was how that deal worked. And then I went back. I went down to see about taking, you know, getting the benefits from the VA. Not available. Too many people got out of the army, and then I stayed here. See, I got out when I was 21. First, I bought a chunk of property up in Cameron Park, but I didn't know what CC and R's were, and nobody explained it. So that deal, I had to get rid of the property. And then my friend, she sold me the property and found me a house on in Folsom, in the old part of town. And then, but it was a rat hole. Everybody thought it was, I bought it to tear it down. But uh, dad's a farmer, we could fix anything, so. But I stayed there until dad passed away and then came back here and then bought it out of the estate. And then I remodeled it again. All except for one bedroom and a bathroom because I keep getting killed with all my injuries. Mm. But yeah, I worked for Sheets and then I went to work for, well, it was AAA Crane. I worked there 26 years. And did you marry? Nope. Thought about it once. But she disciplined me for talking to her kid, and that deal was done instantly. I just go, this is never going to work. And I think, by then, I didn't care. You know, you need to, well, you, I don't know. I'm just one of those that don't care. I'm happy. I've got my friend. She just lives around the corner. And she takes care of me 
Gosh, how long has she been taking care of me? A long time. 30 years? But Jerry, you did marry. Yes, I did. A local girl? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the guy that owned the rental yard. Yeah. He had uh, the Hancock service station in Orangeville, if you remember that. And what was his name? Carl Johnson. I worked for him. Huh? You worked for that station. You worked there too? You worked for Carl? I was there when that car ran through the back. You were there with oh. John Hoback and oh, that's, uh, that was, Peterson. Uh, what's his name? I can't the think. Tall, of, skinny guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw him not too long ago. Yeah. Oh, that was the Carl right. Straddle in two buildings at once. Right over here. What the hell was his name? He uh, lives in paradise now. I don't know. Jesus, I, I know him. I know him real well, but yeah, he did a great job and went to go test him and drove right through the building. Called he up not Carl. Only did that, but he was fooling around with his carburetor. He was what? Messing around with his carburetor too. Oh, was he doing that too? Yeah, and it went full throttle. Yeah, he, he went right through all that oil. Right into that oil. <laughs> and it, it was funny. Gosh, he lived right was, across the street. I from was up there when went up there when it happened, and, I just, and he was just. You, you knew Carl. You, you know he could be very. Hostile if he wanted to be. Intimidating. He killed, you know, but he was very uh, level headed and thought things out. And, I, and he was just dumbfounded. He couldn't believe one of his employees did this, you know. It was hard. He had this whole back wall of oil. There must have been 30, 36 oh, cases mm -hmm. of oil set on this whole wall. Dead center. Through the building and almost did the next building. It did. It hit the it next did it hit building. the next building? Yeah, he his front, his front, the hinges on his front door were right at that building. Yeah. He had just enough room to open his door and get out and look dumbfounded. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of his name. He moved to Paradise and had a okay tire store forever, and he finally retired and gave it to his kid. Yeah. So you married Carl's daughter. I married Carl's daughter. Jan, was it? Jan? Vicky. Vicky, that's it. Yeah, he, he paid me five bucks to take her out. I was up there one day. Was I was, you just go up there and hang out, you know, talk to the guys. All the kids talk to out him. There. Yeah, you know, because he was pretty cool to talk to and very easy to get along with. And he, he was just a, kind of a big kid in his own way. Uh, but he. Uh, he was up there, and I was up there with him. And matter of fact, I bought one of my first cars from him too. But I was up there, and uh, his wife Shirley came up with her, their daughter, and he says, "Hey, Jerry, here's five bucks. Why don't you go take Vicky and get a coke and go go keep Since her you occupied?" you could walk across the street and get one. Back when it was a really good place to eat. Yeah, and... Uh, Foster Freeze was so good. And we married a short time afterwards, a couple years after that. Where it's been... It'll be 53 years. Don't look at me, I don't keep score. 53 years in June 13th. Long time. Did you have children? Had one boy, Brian. He just turned 49. And uh, when I was gonna decided that I needed to get out of the station for sanity, uh, I offered just to give him the business. You mean the rental yard? At the rental yard, the business. Give it to him. He paid me a thousand dollars a month, whatever, whatever he could spare. I'd be fine. And uh, he says, "No way, I'm getting out of here." I don't like the politics. I said, I don't like the politics. He says, I'm going to Idaho. And he had just got a divorce from his first wife. She was nuts. A uh, year or so before. And he had met another gal online. And she had a daughter up in Coeur d'Alene. And that's where he's at now. He got married this year. Did he go to school here locally, your son? Yeah, he went to school at the... Uh, Oh, he went to the private school. Yeah, he went to a private school there that... Uh, so now the church is Loaf of Bread or something. Loaf of Bread Church. House of Bread? Yeah. Yeah, whatever. That used to be a church school there. 
and he went through uh, from high school. His four years there. There we went to Fair Oaks Elementary School, but uh, he went there. Then uh, shortly after that, I told him you got to go to work. Can work for me or go work for somebody, but you can't just hang out. It's time to earn your living, and nobody hangs out. And he he was a very good worker. I mean. He knew that business inside and out. He's a smart kid. Customers really liked him too. Yeah, he, he was just a nice guy. And he's working at uh, for the city of Post Falls, which is right next door to Coeur d'Alene. And he's going to be there for almost a year. He went up there. He was so desperate to get out of California. He says, we're going to go up and look around up there. I says, don't do nothing stupid. I told him that four times. Don't do nothing stupid. Come back, said, I bought a house. <laughs> Can I borrow the money? <laughs> I said, no. Grandma gave him the money. And uh, it's a good thing he did because now the prices up there are the same as they are here. Yeah, people can't even, prices oh, have gone goodness. up so high. He went up there and he could, he, there's, everywhere you go, there's, there's people looking for work. Workers, so it's just there's no no job or all these jobs. There's no people for him to go to work at, and he took a job on with Winco. He was hired actually over the phone, and he worked at Winco. Winco the first year, pushing carts in the snow at 32 below. And he says it's great. I said, you nuts? No pressure. Not like here. Everything here is. Just ever says when you get them in, you get them in, you get them done. Then he got moved over to the fish department, which he loves to fish. He's a fisherman. And that was why, one reason why he wanted to go up there. And he was cutting fish and flaying them, and everything. they were really happy with him. But you know what it pays? Ten dollars and fifty cents an hour. Yeah, starter guys, but they're no way owned. No wages uh, when you. If you stay there a long time, I was talking to some gals up here. Some of them got a million dollars. Yeah, they're or two million dollars. They get retirement. they get a real they get a low wage. They get a great benefit pack that feeds into it, and they manage it for you. Uh, if you would stay there 20, 20 years, you'd probably have well over a million dollars in it. Uh, but he went to work for the city. He loves it. He's in road maintenance. He does. Everything from snow removal to road patching to making road signs and putting road stripes down, and he loves it. He well, absolutely loves it up there. They called him to hire him. Yeah. He told them, I said, well, how'd you get on with them? He goes, I got a phone call one day. They're looking for people. I said, so they're going to hire you right out of the grocery store? And he goes, yep. And I went, wow. Yeah. Well, he, he had sent him a resume a long, long time ago. And I think the the 20 years or so in the rail yard business probably made a big impact because of all the equipment knowledge. And no drugs. And no drugs. You know, hard it is to have, find somebody who doesn't smoke dope. Yeah. They have a hard time with that. But he absolutely loves it. He's got his great little life up there. And he was just here couple weekends. Last okay. weekend. Last weekend. Came no, down you're right, the weekend before. For a couple days. So does he miss Orangevale? Absolutely not. Hmm. And how about you all now? You've, you've lived here a lot of your lives. How do Most you feel? Of our lives. How do you feel about Orangevale? I like it, but everything around it sucks. <laughs> our government sucks. They give everything away. They don't take care of business. I mean, when was the last time you seen them fix a road out here? Put a sign up. Call the sheriff, see how long it takes to get here. You how know, they spend their money is not chase the, the wisest off. way to do it. You know, people in their politics, you know, I, I don't know who it was, what her name is, uh, Orangeville, whatever it was, Chamber, put that electric sign up at the... Uh, what the down there in the middle of the street where it says downtown Orangevale. Yeah. Is that ridiculous? Isn't that dumb? And I, I there's I, a long story behind that. 
Oh, there well, is. Well, then, what it was, it's federal money. And see, it's they, a grant. It's a grant money, and they had to, they were running out of time, what to do it. And everybody said, put a sign like everybody else, leaving Orangeville, entering Orangeville, high and by. And make it simple, make it pretty, and yeah. you'll spend your money. We'll go down to downtown Roseville. I mean, no, they said, well, no, we need a downtown. There is no downtown. There's never been a downtown. You know, Hazel Avenue was supposed to be downtown. Then they said, oh, no, well, we go back farther. We'll go down to Maine. Well, there's nothing at Maine. There was three ga four ga three gas stations, a grocery store. Well, it was actually a garage and, a and garage. two gas stations. It was the economy corner to start with. Yeah. And then the grocery store. And then the other two were, were service stations. There was well, taxi the economy car. corner, and then the gas station was the yeah. one that Mel took over. Yeah. And then on the other side, that was a garage, but I don't remember if they had pumps. Yeah, it had pumps there. That was a flying Folsom, A. Folsom was supposed to put a deal across the greenback so at the property line. Yeah. The boundary. Yeah, everybody's and going. And Orangevale was going to put something on the other side of that side. Right. That makes better uh, sense. Yeah. And Folsom reneged. Well, Folsom. Well, that doesn't surprise me. When I lived in Folsom, that was a terrible place. I started out, the first 10 years was great. You didn't have to, you wanted a building permit, you called up a Marvin. He was the building inspector. He'd come over to your house, and i go, hey, Marvin, or Dad would do it because Dad knew him. Hey, Marvin, we're going to take this back porch, and it had this shower and stuff in here because the previous owner or the one before that took care of dogs, you know, they had a, you know, where they showered and whatever you want to call them. And we're just going to, the plumbing's there, we're going to turn it into a half bath. And he'd go, well, what are you going to do? So I'd tell him, and he'd go, that's fine. And then before I got done, they rezoned me three times to multiple buildings, and I'm on a lot that's 58 feet wide and 250 feet deep, and they want to put multiple dwellings on it. Because whoever got paid off. And then they changed our zoning, like I said, three times, and we'd go to the meetings, everybody in town would go, no, and they'd pass it. It's paid off. And then just before I sold out, they wanted me to cut down the trees in front of my house to make more parking for people so they could go to the old old town. And I'm looking at them like, you're stupid. And one time the mayor's wife came to my house. I told her she was stupid. And she's an attorney. And she's trying to get me to sign a thing to raise my property taxes to put in more bike trails and that giant swimming pool that they put in. And then there's a theater that you probably don't know about over at that school on, uh, I don't know, whatever the road is that heads out to the dam, the back road by Lexington Downs and down oh, through yeah. there. Yeah, I don't know the name of that. Well, in that high school, there's a there's a full theater in there. I think it seats five or 600 people. I worked on it when I was a crane operator. And I said, you tell the rich people to pay for it. I go, how much money do you think we have? I says, you're an attorney. You piss off more money than I earn. And she was, she finally left. But that's when I, I was so glad to get out of Folsom. And now Orangeville is becoming just like Folsom. But, you know, everybody's crooked over there in government. The yeah, mayor they've well, got now is still crooked. Sure, it's he was part of the guy that tried there. swindling out Tommy of the house. They're crooked. They're all crooked. I work for old Jack Kip. He's crooked. When he was over there, me and that Virgil Rams, I told you, I, we delivered furniture and appliances from his store. And when people would come into the store, he says, don't move it, don't move it, set it down. And when they'd leave with them, we'd load the truck up. And then we took two loads to some place down an alley downtown in one of his trucks and unloaded it all. He was crooked. Do you remember all the rock piles? There in, in Folsom, where they, all the rock trailings went from the dredges, mm -hmm. where the Mervyns was and all mm -hmm. that. And you know how they got rid of all that? Mm. They didn't. They didn't. Kip sold it. Mm. Took no the environmental. They didn't do anything. Nothing. They didn't put the dirt on to stop the rocks. You're supposed to put, an, so there's an inch of dirt between all those cobbles, because when the ground moves, they're like ball bearings. No. And those apartments that are, gosh, again, whatever that road is. School? No, no, no. The one that, the long one that goes down all the way to 
it was. Folsom Boulevard. It's a something creek. Anyway, oh, yeah. all those apartments they built back in there, I worked on them too. And before they even got the houses done, there were complete cracks because the buildings were moving. It was all like that. Lexington Downs, the roads fell apart five years after they got them done because they sold all the property to the people that moved up with Intel and the Bay Area people that sold their little tiny house and got a million dollars for it. And they come up here and spent 300000 bought new cars and boats, and then they couldn't buy the furniture for their houses. Because they, I knew I worked for a bunch of contractors that I'd been working for. You know, we'd, we'd set beams. Sometimes they'd make all the walls, and we'd stand them because it's super fast.